welcome back to a very hazy episode in Spain. And a warning for mentions of suicide in this episode. The woman today was renowned for dancing and seducing kings as one of the three top courses of La Belle Epoque, France. However, as we shall see, I'd also call her a highly unreliable narrator. Ooh, and who is she? La Belle Otero. So Carolina, sometimes called Caroline Otero, is definitely born in Spain, probably Galicia, to a poor mother in probably 1868. I love all the qualifiers there. Her father is up for debate. And it's uh, this story of him as a Greek army officer that throws a lot of maybes into everything here. Mm -hmm. You see, the story came from Otero herself years later, but it's very unlikely such a man existed. But she did have a father. Yes. Her mother was not the Virgin Mary. Mm Mm-hmm. So where does she get this Greek soldier story, then? I am not entirely sure. To me, the story sounds similar to that of the Opera Carmen, which, as we shall see, her story intertwines a bit with. For those who don't know, a basic summary of the plot of Carmen is that a soldier is seduced by a Roma woman. He ends up in jail at some point. There's jealousy, and it ends in murder. Wow, dramatic. Yes, and Otero did like to say that her mother was an Andalusian gypsy. So, we have a soldier, we have a Roma woman, there's a passionate love affair filled with jealousy. Also, I find it hard to believe a Greek soldier is in Spain in the 1860s. Long enough to keep a mistress and have three or so children before marrying her without having to move to another country during that time. Mm, Were there other, like, conflicts during that time with Spain and other places? Or Greece, I guess, and other places? Not really. So Greece is still a relatively young country, having gotten its independence from the Ottoman Empire only a couple of decades earlier. So also, at the time, the Greek army is quite small. There's really, there's no reason I can find for why the Greek army is in Spain. Right, and they wouldn't like be able to afford to just station someone there for indefinitely if they have no diplomatic or military relations with Spain beyond the usual stuff. Yeah, so so it's likely that this is something that she has invented. Any clue as to who he might have been instead? Considering what we can parse together that is probably true about her birth and upbringing, I would say he's more than likely Spanish and also poor. He may have run off somewhere leaving his wife and multiple children. He may have died in a jealous duel. That part may be true. He may also have had a gambling addiction. So what we do know about him isn't good. What we can probably infer isn't good, yes. Right, sorry, sorry. We need more qualifiers for this woman's life. We do know that Otero was sent to be a maid in a wealthier family's household at about the age of 10. That is young. Poor family, kids have to bring in some money. We also know that during her time as a maid, she was raped. Now, given the attitudes of her time, her family wasn't of much help, and she herself appears to have had very little education. As a consequence, she's basically thrown out of her employment and home. Love that. Love attitudes of that time. Do we know who the perpetrator was? Was it, like, another member of the staff? Was it one of the family? It sounds like it was likely to be one of uh, the family members, like the husband or a friend of his. Wow. (laughs) It's 
just so horrible. I mean, it's like taking advantage of a person, A, but then of a person who is in like a subordinate working position, B. But then C, she's got to be really young at this time. I mean, you say she enters the workforce at 10. So. And then insult to injury, they kick her out. Correct. And we mostly probably know that by about 14, she's dancing with castanets for a living and has a boyfriend named Paco. I hope Paco isn't too much older because, damn, she has had enough trouble for men so far. Paco sounds like he would have been about 20, I want to say. 18 to 20. That's rough. It's a bit vague. The two traveled around, and it appears that she caught the eye of a banker in Lisbon. It said he gave her an apartment, spending money, basically everything she could want in exchange for not dancing anymore. Oh. Do we we think she's going to go for it? (laughs) It, Not for very long, though this may have been the man who brought her to Marseille. Whoever he was, she left him soon after. Well, wow. of course, what else could he expect? I feel like all of these guys are, are making this mistake around this time. Oh, I, I can fix her by fixing her up. And it's like, no, no she's just going to take what she wants. She, this is not a situation of fixing. Now, she may have taken up with an old count soon after leaving the banker. We do know that somehow she got dancing engagements. And that at some point... Her employment ends, and she found her way to Paris in 1889. Do we know what draws her to Paris? It's the capital city. Of- it's, it's the it place. It's the place to be. <laughs> yes. And she manages to find a job as a dancer there. By spring now, what of exactly? Eight- oh, sorry. Um, but what, what exactly is this dancing job? I mean, is she, like, partner dancing with people? Is she, like, the hired... Um, entertainment for a club like who is employing her is it private it's not partner dancing it's dancing routines she comes up with castanets being involved very inspired by spain and what i think she thinks roma culture is Mm. and we're not entirely sure that she is in fact roma or of roma descent i think she made that part up I see. Uh, So so it is likely an interpretation based on some stereotypes. Now, would this have been kind of the equivalent of being a stripper? Or would this have been more the equivalent of like a a lounge singer or something? What is the social implication of this? From what I've gathered from how people talk about her dancing, they describe it as very wild and what they would consider to have been gypsy culture. Mm-hmm. And so forth. Uh, basically not respectable, slightly scandalous, very a draw to men. Mm-hmm. So it's it's exotic dancing in more ways than one, but not necessarily at the level of sex work. No, and it doesn't necessarily involve taking her clothes off. Mm-hmm. Though, as we will see, she did once wear a bra entirely made of gemstones and jewels. By spring of 1890, though, she's managed to get an engagement at the Cirque de Té, and it launches her career. There's press talking and people gossiping. The gossip was probably helped by the fact that she would occasionally dance on tabletops after dinner, even at restaurants. (laughs) Nice. Um, Did she charge for those, or was that just kind of spur of the moment? It seems to have been spur of the moment. (laughs) Lovely. I guess it's free advertising. Everyone's trying to do that in a different way, and this is hers. Yes, and I do think that she enjoyed dancing. Mm -hmm. Now, naturally, there are also men chatting her up, including the Duke Jacques Duzet, who was also chasing Emmeline de Lenson, as we saw last episode. Yeah, so a duke, so she's moving up in the world. Speaking of men, the press talked about far more men than just the duke. 
Stories included her marrying a General Otero to appease her parents and being abducted by agents of King Alfonso XII of Spain, which led to her fleeing the palace out of a window. Now, was any of this substantiated? No. <laughs> Great, so she's not the only one obscuring her life story with, I don't know, fables and, what is it, confabulations? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry, do we do we know um, where the Otero comes from if it's not from a general Otero? No, it is also not from marrying a Marquis d'Otero in Rome, having a daughter getting divorced, and then sending the child to her mother. Well, <laughs> yeah, so do we know anything about her relationship with her family at the time? Does she have a daughter? Is she in contact with them? I'm not entirely sure if she ever makes contact with, like, her mother again. I wouldn't be surprised if she didn't. She doesn't have a daughter. In fact, Otero never has any children at all. Oh, well, lucky in her line of business. It's thought that the rape left her sterile. So Otero is the only one of the courtesans we've discussed that doesn't ever have children. Which she was actually rather grateful for, because she would describe getting down on her knees and praying before each uh, client showed up that she wouldn't have a child, she wouldn't get pregnant. Yeah, wow. That sounds terrifying to always be concerned about that. Ugh, I could not be in that line of work. I would be so scared. Now, back to her dancing. Her success at the circus leads to a several months long engagement in New York City. However, once back in France, she took a trip to Monte Carlo, which has the casino. She proceeded to lose practically all of the money she'd earned on her American trip. Oof. That so that's where the, the speculation that her um father might have been might have had a gambling addiction would come from. Is that sometimes that sort of thing does run in families. Yes, and Otero very much had a gambling addiction. During one losing streak, actually, the casino employee told her that she had nothing left to bet. So Otero climbed onto the table, hitched up her skirt, mooned him, and asked him how much her ass was worth. I've not found any record if she managed to turn that particular losing streak around or if she was allowed to bet herself. That's not a great place to be in. I mean, I know that a lot of her like work as a courtesan is trading on her physical charms, but that sounds like a particularly like low place for her. Addictions tend to do that to people. Mm -hmm. Now, we do know that at some point she gets contracts to dance in Germany and that she meets Baron Ulstrader there. He apparently was not good looking, but he had money. Which I guess she does need at this time. Yes, it was a lucrative time, in fact, yielding cash and 36 pearls. Ooh. Of course, nothing was ever drama-free. At one point, she lost a few pearls on stage, and when they were found, the man said they were fake. Oof. Who knows if they were, because as Leanne de Pugy once said, when Cavigliari wears real jewels, they look fake. When Otero wears fake jewels, they look real. Wow, such high praise. Now, who is Cavalieri? She was a star actress of the Folie Bergère at the time. Oof, so a burn. Yes, very much a burn. Unfortunately for Otero, she lost the pearls, too. Years later, she would pawn them for 100,000 francs to cover gambling debts. Oof. She then goes to Russia and goes through one Grand Duke after another. Supposedly, she also has a brief affair with Nicholas II when he's still Tsarevich and not yet married to Alex of Hesse. However, I find that unlikely as Otero is never mentioned in biographies of his I've come across. The only mention of a mistress includes a prima ballerina before he married. Ah, well. Still, it, it sounds like... As as with other courtesans, um, there is kind of this attempt to <laughs> do lists and lists and lists of all of their potential lovers and and mark that on their achievement board like like a high score or something. 
Yes. How many kings have you had in a 20-year career? <laughs> During this time, though, she's offered the opportunity to record one of her dances using early film technology. Mm-hmm. We actually still have this footage today on the internet. That is really cool. And I'm sure that's really nice for her to see dancing, something that she actually cares about, um, become something that can be immortalized from her. Yes, though it wasn't without scandal. Ooh. One of the czar's officers appeared in the film, and there was outrage at him being in such a frivolous scene. Yeah, how dare he have fun? Shame. And with the courtesan of all things. Mm-hmm. I'm sure she thoroughly enjoyed corrupting him. All in all, Russia was a good venture. Yeah, and, and she hasn't gotten back into debt yet. Not, Not yet. yet. When she returns to Paris, she then met up with Prince Bertie, the future King Edward VII of England. And a man well known for his love of women and carousing. Aha, uh-huh. and that I'm sure added to her coffers. In a strange way, yes, because despite this pronounced love, he wasn't the biggest spender. He was just as likely to send pheasants as he was diamonds. Ah, romantic. Otero came off of it better than most. She got a hunting lodge outside Paris where he could meet her discreetly. Ah, so at least she has property. Yes, though she preferred her apartment on the Champs-Élysées that some other Englishman bought her. Wow. Now, throughout this time, is there anyone who's, like, special to her? Or are, is she really just going from fling to fling to, to get the money out of it? She seems to be going just from fling to fling. Mm-hmm. I get the feeling from Otero that she's more like Valtes than she is Leanne and Emmeline. She's not quite as co- outwardly cold as Valtes was, but she doesn't really have her own, like, true love affairs going on. Mm, gotcha. So this is, this is a business arrangement. In fact, it's such a business arrangement that... When one man suggests, well, when one man says he absolutely must spend half an hour with her, she sticks to the half an hour rule despite fully knowing and proving herself correct that it takes half an hour just to get down to her underwear or naked. (laughs) Even just going as fast as she can to get all of the layers off. Well, that is funny. That, like, really shows how different the time period was that even your scandalous women would be wearing layers upon layers. Yes, with buttons. Zippers were not yet a thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, imagine. Yeah, it's not designed until the early 1900s. Wow. So. Weirdly late, because it's not like. I mean, it, you don't need, like, electricity for it or anything. No, and a patent isn't gone until 1917. So, wow. buttons galore. Mm-hmm. A tragedy for that man. You see, Otero herself was not very sympathetic to all these men. Mm-hmm. During a conversation with the writer Colette, she once said that a man is almost all his life a miser. Then there's a moment where the palm is opened wide. And Colette naturally thought she meant during during the moment of passion, Otero replied that it is when you twisted his wrist. Ooh, wow. That's some cynicism. This isn't really surprising since, like Val tested, she would go and make legal claims against men for the money they owed her. Mm hmm. Oh, good. I mean, she is putting a lot of effort into her image and into kind of keeping up this business. And so if someone owes her something, then. They'd better pay it up, or her business doesn't work. Very true. Now, during all of this, there is a story of one man killing himself over her. Oh, did that actually happen? There's many, many doubts, because there's stories of six men having uh, committed suicide over her, and no one can tell if any of it is true. Gotcha. So so what are the details? What are what are the hot deeds? So in one story, it said she took on a very jealous Englishman who refused to have any rival as he saw it. 
while shaking him off for a while, she met another man who complimented her dancing, said he loved her, and sent her 10,000 francs. Wow, that's how you do it. Yes, so they met outside a cafe in a park. Because mm-hmm. she had gone on a walk or a horseback ride or something. Mm-hmm. Unnerved, and especially with a very jealous man breathing down her neck, she ignored this second man. That, you know, that makes sense. That is a bit much, and especially with this other guy. Yes. Now, this second man apparently shot himself at the place they met. Whew. Cue a blow-up with the jealous Englishman and the press reveling in the scandal. It said she declined every request for interviews. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, no matter no matter what parts of this are true, it's still a nightmare. Soon after, the jealous Englishman left, and she lost a house during all that. But if any of this is true, I think she probably breathed a sigh of relief. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like two guys who maybe felt they had a bit more claim on her than they should have. Yes, but no one can tell if any of that is even true. Right. (laughs) So, (laughs) who knows? Yes, this is a very hazy episode. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, does does she um, write about this or try to promote anything about it, or does she just not address this publicly at all? This particular story actually ended up in her memoirs. Mm, all right, all right. So <laughs> she gives some account of it, but whether it's true or not. No one entirely knows. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess for her sake, we'll hope that it isn't. We do know that by June of 1912 her acting career took an unexpected leap up she was offered the role of carmen now had she been doing acting prior to this she had done a little bit here and there in addition to her dancing though she was primarily known as a dancer Mm -hmm. was she any good at acting that we know she appears to have had more talent than either Leanne de Pugy and even Emmeline de Lenson. I'm assuming that's why she did fairly well, it sounds like, in the role of Carmen. Because keep in mind, Carmen is not only acting, it's singing. It's an opera. Right. Yeah. Is, is she trained as a singer? I'm not entirely sure. There's not really much mention of her singing prior to this. Interesting. So it's it's kind of a um um when Madonna was in um Evita. I mean Madonna was a singer, but you know what I'm saying? Like that it's a, a person who's famous for one thing who is doing a different thing. And were there mixed responses? Were people into it? So the press and the public both went nuts. Professional singers were appalled. Mm-hmm. In the end, there was actually a court order forbidding her from continuing in the role. Ooh. <laughs> Do we know anything about that? Like, who filed that? Did did she get past it, or did she just stop? She did just stop, and it seems to have been instigated by the professional performers. Wow. All right, then. It was viewed as something about taking opportunity f- away from the professionals. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. I mean, you hear it now there's kind of a, a rumbling about um, the live action film actors um, taking roles from voice actors because people will um, hire the person who has the big name but doesn't necessarily have the skills. So I can imagine a similar thing happening in 1912. Yes. Though also keep in mind Even if she did do well in the role of Carmen, it was a very different sort of Carmen. Mm -hmm. Uh, In fact, people at one point sort of thought of her as the personification of the character, like a real-life Carmen. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like she kind of also pushed forward this image of herself as Carmen, as as feisty and um, playing up a Roma connection that may or may not have existed in her lineage. Though this isn't the only impact she makes in 1912. The Carlton Hotel in Keynes 
is built, and it is said that the twin cupolas on the roof are modeled after her breasts. Ooh, scandalous. Otero was always scandalous. Mm-hmm. By now, it's 1914. World War I rolls in. She decides against being a nurse, actually, and instead turned to charity work. Also, during this entire time, she doesn't dance or perform for the entire war. Wow. How come? She's too busy organizing help for the wounded and refugees and raising money. So how does one raise money if if not dancing in front of people? I suspect she is still dancing in front of people, but at charity events. Mm -hmm. So she's not making money for herself. Correct. During this time, it also appears that she may have taken a young Algerian refugee boy under her wing. If she did, it doesn't look like she adopted him, but she paid for his education and provided for him until he could have a career. If he did, in fact, exist. That was awfully generous of her. (laughs) It did happen. There's also a story of her freeing some slave in a port city in southern France. Again, I have no idea about the veracity of that. There's some people who will repeat everything she says as if it's absolute truth, and other people are like, this is a bit odd. Mm Mm-hmm. Were there still slaves in France? No. It would have been illegal. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, just because something is illegal doesn't mean people don't still do it. Right. No, and I mean, we have human trafficking to some degree even today. But, so, (laughs) so who knows? I'm, I'm sure there could have been, you know, around a port, some sort of human trafficking thing. But I'm not an expert in the time period, so I wouldn't venture a guess to how accurate her story may or may not be. Now, in terms of her career, there is an offer to return to the stage in 1918, but she doesn't take it due to a car accident. Oof. How bad was it? Bad enough to keep her from taking the offer? I suspect she took a bit more time for recovery than someone who had less money would take because it's not until the start of the 1920s that she's figuring out what she wants to do with her career Mm -hmm. and she decides it's time to retire. Now, how old is she? She's in her 50s. Mm -hmm. And she announced that she wanted to retire in in. Full beauty. Making a graceful exit. Yes. A few years after this, Leanne de Pugy mentioned in her journal that she spotted Otero out in public and called her beautiful despite being roly-poly. Oh, that's mean. (laughs) And I mean, what do you expect? She's been active and dancing her whole life, and and I don't know what the car accident injuries are, but I'm, I'm sure she's a lot more sedentary. I'm not entirely sure if it was meant as mean, because Leanne did say that every age had its beauty Mm -hmm. during that same sentence. Yeah, that's that's nice. It's just a bit a bit fat shaming, which we don't like. During this time period, fat shaming is more acceptable, Mm -hmm. as evidenced by uh, Natalie Barney complaining about Lucy Delarue Marjorie's opera singing lover being quite round. Well, that's her problem. Because I'll have you know that fat people are attractive. And that's that. Moving on, at the time of Otero's retirement, it's estimated that she had made $25 million. Whew! So she is living it up. Yes, but she still has a gambling addiction. Ah, so she is living it up for an amount of time, (laughs) and then she is having a problem. Yes, this is not helped by the fact she moves to the south of France to be closer to Monte Carlo. And I guess, were were there, um, like, rehab places, or was was there a knowledge that gambling addiction existed? 
all sorts of addiction treatment and understanding of them were still very rudimentary. You would probably be have just been sent to a sanitarium, like all the alcoholics were. So, not the best options. Correct. And Otero essentially gambles her fortune away. So much so that she would downgrade to one room in a shared house. Not even a house she owned. Wow, after $25 million and a very successful career. That poor woman. Yes, she has absolutely nothing, but the Monte Carlo Casino was convinced by some people to give her a small pension due to the fact she lost so much money there. Right, she she got such good business for them that... However, despite aging slowly into the oblivion of the modern world, there is still a bit of interest in her. Enough to make a film, in fact. In 1954, the film La Belle Otero came out with the Mexican actress Maria Felix portraying Otero. Mm -hmm. How does she think? Like, Is this a good portrayal of her? Does she like it? She was pleased about this. You can actually find photos of her with the actress who portrayed her. Oh, that's wonderful. So she wasn't entirely forgotten. Yeah, unlike a lot of the women who kind of die in obscurity. Yes, despite the fact that she believed that women's only mission in life was to be beautiful. Oof. As she said, when one gets old, one must learn how to break mirrors. I am very gently expecting to die. Oof. Wow. And die she did, of a heart attack at the age of 96 in April 1965, in Nice. Wow. Now, did people come to her funeral? Was she still known? Um, Was was this a kind of parade sort of situation, or more of a a quiet affair? It was a very quiet affair, because very few people came to her funeral. Mm Mm-hmm. Some claimed to have seen a silent young Algerian lingering on the edges before leaving without saying a word. Ah, so there is the possibility that she had, in fact, helped that young Algerian. Or maybe not. (laughs) Who knows? She got famous and still there's question marks all over her life. Yeah, she goes to the grave as a woman of mystery. Well, at, at least there were people to come, and at least she had a funeral, and at least she was known even later in her life. That's a lot better than can be said for some. Yes, and she's had many more books written about her than some of the other women we've covered. Mm. That's that's good that people are looking into it. Now, is she written about at all by our kind of Paris Lesbos arty set, or do they ignore her because she by all appearances is straight colette mentions her in her book my apprenticeships because they were at least very good acquaintances if not friends Mm -hmm. and not anything more not anything more I'm, i'm glad that she sees herself reflected in the culture it's it's good that she made an impact thank you for listening Follow us on Twitter, subscribe if you want, and remember, you might have a gambling problem if you bet your ass at a card table.